do what we say we believe. So, Father, I pray that you would work on us today. In Christ's name we pray. Okay. So, we are going to be in, we're going to finish Genesis 19 today, and I struggled, and I thought, should I include chapter 20? And I made the executive decision, yes, I'm going to include chapter 20. Because if we did chapter 20 the following week, we would lose some very pertinent stuff that comes together. And as we go through these two chapters, we're going to see that, uh, well, we will see uh, the birth of two enemy nations of Israel. Now, here's a little thing I wrote down. Sometimes the Bible gets uncomfortably graphic. However, because this is God's word, there is something he wants us to know. I will do my best to keep this tactful, but there may be some things in this passage that may make you uncomfortable. And as we go through this today, our main point is going to be God has always protected the messianic line for the salvation of all types of people. I'll repeat that one more time. God has always protected the messianic line for the salvation of all types of people. So, Bart, can you read... Genesis 1930, please. And Lot went up from Zoar and stayed in the mountains and his two daughters with him, for he was afraid to stay in Zoar and he stayed in a cave. He and his two daughters. Thank you, Barb. So why was Lot living in Zor. Do you remember? Lord Dwight! Do you guys remember why Lot was living in Zor? What happened last week? Pardon me? Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Okay, so why did he go to Zor? Because it was closer than Mount It was closer. That's right. So who was he living with? His two daughters. Where was his wife? She turned, okay, great. She was turned into a pillar of salt. Why was she turned into a pillar of salt? She, she looked back. And last week we learned what it meant to look back. What does that really mean? Did, that's right. You didn't want to leave your sinful past. You enjoyed your sinful old lifestyle too much. Where did Lot go when he left Zor? To the mountains. To the mountains or to the hills. Who did he go with? His two daughters. His two daughters. Why did he why did he leave? He was afraid. What was he afraid of? God's wrath. Well, God's wrath already happened, but good guess. He was afraid of the locals. Afraid? Yeah, he was afraid of the locals. Why do you think he was afraid of the locals? Was Zor far away from Sodom and Gomorrah or close? Okay. Who's the only survivor? Lot and his two daughters. Human nature. Human nature says, there's something different about this guy. It must be him. This is the reason. I wrote down, People would blame him for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
He was a well-known politician. And he was known for his righteousness in the area. Therefore, it's your fault, Lot, that they were destroyed. Not theirs, yours. Where did he move his family to? I think we talked about it. To the mountains. My dear, can you read uh, 1931? One day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to lie with us, as is custom all over the earth. Okay. What did the firstborn say to the younger? There's no man here. There's no man here. What was their concern? And There's no husbands. No husbands. Why? And uh, let me read this again. Okay, that's good. Uh, 1932, please, Esther. <clears throat> Let's get our father to drink wine and then lie with him and preserve our family line through our father. Okay. Why did they want to make Lot drunk? So they can have that's right. That answers verse 14. Seeing that they had to make Lot drunk, did they know what they were about to do was wrong? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Where do you think they would have got this detestable idea from? Growing up in Sodom. Growing up in Sodom. You're right. I wrote this down. If we do not have a life engulfed in the Word of God, we will commit the same sins as the people we are surrounded by. I gave some examples here. If you live in Canmore and Banff, it's highly new age. Hey, guys. If you live in Canmore and Banff, it's highly new age. Guess what your sins are going to be? In line with new age teaching. If you live in Haiti, it's highly occultic and voodoo. Guess what your sins are going to be? More on the lines of occult and voodoo. In Texas... You know that they have an online sex offender registry. You can type in your zip code and hundreds of people, hundreds of people will come up with pictures, addresses, and the sex crime they committed. What do you think is the predominant sin in Texas? Sexual assault. That's right. So... Your community that you live in, whatever that predominant sin is, is what your flesh is going to be mostly attracted to. These girls had options. Number one, they could have gone to see Uncle Abraham and Aunt Sarah, who lived up the hill from them, and they could have introduced them to some nice men to marry. Number two, they could have gone to another town, found some nice men to marry. Number three, uh, here's the question. So why did they choose this sin? Because their father was old. Their father was old? That's an idea. But why did they choose this sin? What did we learn? Yeah. Birds of a feather. Flock together. Again, you will go back to the sin that you were brought up with and surrounded by. 
whose turn is it? Esther, you've already read? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Molly, can you read 1933, please? That night they got their father to drink wine, and the older daughter went in and lay with him. He was not aware of it when she lay down or when she got up. Thank you. What did the firstborn... No, that's wrong. Who made their father drunk? Both. Both. What did the older do? Did Lot know what happened? No. Uh, Peter. Paul. Get my apostles correct. Okay. There, 34 of that. That's it. The next morning, the older daughter said to her younger sister, I had sex with our father last night. Let's get him drunk with wine again tonight. And you could go and have sex with him. That way we'll, we will preserve our family line through our father. What did the firstborn say to the younger? Let's get him drunk again. Let's get him drunk again and do the same thing. Do you recall someone else from Genesis that got drunk? Did Ham tell his siblings what he did? Yeah. Who was born from that union? Canaan. You're right. And what was put onto Canaan? A curse. Okay, Paul, you've read. Bob. Can you read verses 35 to 36, please? So we made for your father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she lay down. Thus both the daughters of Lot were child by their father. Thank you. What did the daughters do? Yeah, they got dad drunk again. What did the younger daughter do? I can't hear you. She went and lied with her dad. What happened to both daughters? They became pregnant. Rita, can you read verses 37 and 38, please? Thank you. What were the names of the two boys that were born? Moab and? And ben -Ami. Which nations did these boys father? The Moabites and? And the Amorites. Or Ammonites. Okay. Now, Remember me saying to you, you will never fully understand the New Testament until you have a firm grasp of the Old Testament. Remember me saying that to you? Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. And Ray, I think it's your turn to read. No one has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. No one born of a forbidden marriage, nor any of his descendants, may enter the assembly of the even down to the 10th generation. No Amorite or Moabite or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. 
even down to the 10th generation. Okay, thank you. The book Deuteronomy, I want to talk about the title for a second. Deutero means second, okay? This is the second reading of the law just before the Israelites conquered Canaan to take the promised land. Just right before. That's important. So according to Deuteronomy 23, 1-3, which two nations were not allowed into the assembly of God? Oh! How many generations did they need to wait until they were allowed into the assembly of God? Ten generations. Okay. Turn to the book of Ruth. And I will read Ruth. Ruth chapter 1. And I'm going to read Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years. And both Melon and Kilion died, so that the women was so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Where did Naomi and Elimelech move to and why? Moab? Why did they move there? There was a famine. Do you guys know the biblical reason for a famine in Israel? Part of God's wrath because of sin? I would change that word wrath to discipline. In the blessings and the curses in both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you have a short list of blessings. You have a super long list of curses. And the reason why the curses are so long is not because God is so full of hate and wrath. It's because it's progressive discipline. And the moment you return back to God, boom, the discipline's over. And it's back to blessings. But he does not want to kill you or destroy you. He, it is like three times, three or four times longer are the curses than the blessings. And guess what? The very first curse is if you are not living right with God. I will send you a famine. So now, here's Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons. And there's a famine. What did they need to do to stop the famine? Just turn back to God. Where did they go? Moab. What were they telling God? 
I would rather live in sin than come back to you. What type of women did their sons marry? Moabite women. And what happened to Naomi's husband and sons? They died in Moab. Let's read Ruth 1, 6 to 18, and I'll read this. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had forgiven them and, get, and have given them food. So she set out from that place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you Grant that you may uh, find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were growing? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Where was Naomi going to? Back to Judah. Is Judah in Israel? Okay. What did Ruth say in verse 16 and 17? Pardon me, Molly? I'll go with you. How many generations was Israel in the promised land when this happened? You guys know? Let's take a look. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Guys, you need to know your genealogies. They're there for a reason. Matthew 1. One to six. Uh, and Stacy, I'll have you read. No, I will read it. Those are some big names, and everyone's going to be called Bob. I just know it. So uh, I'll read it. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, 
and Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, and Perez uh, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Selman, and Selman, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and we'll stop there. No, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. There you go. Who did Selman marry? Rahab. Where was Rahab from? Do you guys remember? Jericho. What was the first city conquered when the Israelites came to the promised land? Jericho. Okay. What generation would this be in the promised land? 11. What? 11? No. No. Deuteronomy. What does Deuteronomy mean? Second reading. They're about to go into the promised land. So what generation is this in the promised land? First. Very good. Who was Salmon and Rahab's son? Boaz. Boaz. Who did Boaz marry? Ruth. So what generation was this? The second. So how was Ruth even allowed to be in the assembly let alone the genealogy of Jesus Christ, since she was a Moabite and couldn't legally enter for another eight generations. You're there on something. You're, 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 you're going that way. You're on the right path. Ray, do you know, uh, I don't want to put you on a spot, you can look it up. What does 2 Corinthians 5, 17 say? Yell it, say, read it loud and proud, brother, loud and proud. 2 Corinthians 5? 5, 17, 1, 7, read it loud and proud. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Oh! So how was Ruth allowed in? Born again. She was born again. She, God changed her. She was no longer a Moabite but a child of God. God changed her. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 23.1. Stacy, I'll have you read that. <clears throat> We've already read it once this morning. And so since we've talked about the Moabites and the Ammonites, I thought maybe we'll talk about the other people it mentions. Who's not who's not in allowed in the camp. Chapter 23, verse 1. No one. Is. You gotta say it loud. I don't want to embarrass actually, Greg, you read it so we don't embarrass your wife. <laughs> No one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of God. Thank you. Mine says, no one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of God. And then it goes down to the Moabite and the Ammonites. 
What other type of people are not allowed in the assembly of God? Eunuchs and people that, you got it. The Bible speaks to current events. We, the way that you interpret the Bible is you do not take current events and push them into the Bible. You take the Bible and apply it to current events. What type of surgery do we call it today when the male organ is cut off? No, that's circumcision. No. That's a transgender skin. That's right. It would be called a uh, gender reassignment surgery or a sex change. Rob, let's turn to Isaiah 56, 1 to 5. And I'll let you read that. Actually, Rob, you can read the next one. I will read Isaiah 56, 1 to 5. Thus says the Lord. Keep justice and do righteousness. For my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant. I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigner who joins themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenants, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. <coughs> What two things does God tell us to keep in 56 1? Oh, justice and righteousness. Whose children were supposed to obey these commandments? Molly? Children of Israel. Abraham. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're just, we haven't got to Israel yet. So, yeah, children of Abraham. Who are the true tr children of Abraham, according to Hebrews? Believers, those who trust Jesus Christ in faith. What is coming and what will soon be revealed in verse 1? Salvation is coming. What should the foreigner who joined himself to the Lord not say in verse 3? 
The Lord won't accept me. Won't the Lord won't accept me. I'm a foreigner. We're Ruth and Rahab foreigners. Rahab had the curse of Canaan on her. Ruth had the curse of Moab on her. Not only did God bring them into his family, those two he put into the genealogy of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. What should the eunuch not say in verse 3? I can't hear you, Stacy. Behold, I am a dry tree. What's a eunuch? Castrated man. Castrated man. A feminized man. One that's gone through an operation to feminize him. What type of tree is a dry tree? A dead one. A dead one. A dead, unable to reproduce. I can't have children. It's a dead tree. What does Ephesians 2 1 say? And you were dead in the sins and trespasses in which you once walked. Who is the Lord speaking to in verse 4? To the eunuchs. To the eunuchs. What three things are these specific eunuchs keeping? The Sabbath, God's covenant, and the things that please God. What's that called? When you choose the things that please God instead of the things that please you, what's that called? Righteousness. Righteousness, yeah. Obedience. What? Obedience. Obedience. So what do you need to do to obey? Starts with an R. Repent. Repentance. In verse 5, what three things will God give them? A monument. A name that's what? That's better than sons and daughters. And then you're right, and I'll give them an everlasting name. Do you see the, the Hebrew wordplay at the end? <coughs> that shall not be cut off. You cut it off. I, the Lord, will not cut you off. Can you out sin God's grace? No. Who read last? Rob, I want you to read. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, please. Say it again. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10.
Thank you. What type of people will not inherit the kingdom of God? Sinful people, let's name them off here. Sexually immoral. Idolaters. Adulterers. Idolaters. Thieves. Thieves. Those who practice homosexuality. Prostitutes. Gr prostitutes greeds. Drunkards. Swindlers. Swindlers. Okay. Have you ever practiced one of these sins even once in your life? Yeah. Anyone has ever been greedy once? Uh, the Greek word for sexually immoral is pornea. Uh-huh. Okay. So according to these two verses, what will you inherit? Or what will you not inherit? The kingdom, the kingdom of God. You practice this stuff, you're not going to get in. Tracy, verse 11. Such were some of you, that you were washed. Did you hear that? But such were some of you. That's what you were first. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. As bad as a Moabite. You were as bad as, as an Ammonite, as a Canaanite, as a sexual. You were that bad. But just like the Moabite, the Canaanite, the transsexual, when you come to God in repentance, he cleanses you. He washes you. He gives you a new name. He gives you an eternal name better than sons and daughters. Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to read verse 20, verse 1. And we're going to breeze through this fast. Susan... Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Hebrews and settled between Kadesh and Shur. And he was sojourned. Sojourned in the land. Kind of it means like traveled, migrated. Okay? So where did Abraham move to and where did he sojourn or travel or migrate? Gerar. Okay, great. Uh, Jason, can you read uh, 20 verse 2, please? Abraham introduced his wife, Sarah, by saying, She is my sister. So King Abimelech of Gerar sent for Sarah and had her brought to him at his house. Okay. What did Abraham say? His wife was his sister. His wife was his sister. Did he ever say this before? No. Yeah? Okay. Why did he say it? When he said it before, why did he say it? He didn't want to be killed. He's scared. So why did he say it this time? Still scared. He's still scared. Who was Abimelech? A king, the king of Gerar. And what did Abimelech do? Yeah, guess what? Guess what that means? There is a nine-year-old, super hot woman I'm going to marry.
Okay, Sherry, can you read uh, chapter 20, verses 3 to 5, please? But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, You are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her. So he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Thank you. So what did God say to Abimelech? You're as good as dead. You touch this woman, I'm going to kill you. You're a dead man. Whoa. Did Abimelech sleep with Sarah? No. Did Abimelech declare his innocence? Why would God threaten Abimelech and not Lot's daughters? Ooh. That's interesting. Why would God threaten Abimelech and not those two girls that got their father drunk and raped their father? He's protecting the line. You're right, Jason. He's protecting the messianic line. You see, just before this, this is in between when God said, I will come back this time next year and Sarah will have a child. And if you look at chapter 21, Isaac's born. If Abimelech slept with Sarah the messianic line would be defiled, making that promise of God to Abraham null and void, meaning we could never trust in Jesus because there's a chance it's not true. God's more concerned about his Savior saving you anything else. Twenty verse six. Barbara, can you read twenty verse six, please? Um, I'm going to read for her. You do it. Then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience. So I have kept you from sinning against me. And that is why I did not let you touch her. Thank you. Who prevented Abimelech from sinning? God. God? Can God do that for us? Yes, of course. How do we know? Outside of this. He sent us a helper. He sent us a helper. That I like that one. What else? I guarantee it, everyone in this room and everyone that's on this video right now, even if they don't go to church, know this. You have a conscience. He wrote it on our minds and in our hearts. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Esther, can you read verse 7, please? <coughs> Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all yours will die. Thank you. What did God tell Abimelech to do? 
Return Sarah. What was Abraham? A prophet. What did God use prophets for? Speak on his behalf. I'll just have you guys reference Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. We won't read it right now. We're running out of time. According to Hebrews 1, 1, and 2, that those that know the verse, who does God speak through now? Through the church? Through Christ. Through his son. What would happen if Abimelech did not return Sarah? Abimelech is a dead man. Uh, Molly, can you read verse 8? Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all his officials, and when he told them all that had happened, they were very much afraid. Thank you. What did Abimelech do? All of his officials. What happened to his officials or his servants? They were terrified. Paul, can you read uh, verses 9 and 10? Then Abimelech called for Abraham. What have you done to us, he demanded. What crime have I committed that deserves treatment like this? Making me and my kingdom guilty of this great sin. No one should ever do what you have done. Whatever possessed you to do such a thing. I can hear Abraham speaking through you right now, Paul. <laughs> what did Abimelech do? do to Abraham. Nothing. He gave him a dressing down. He gave him a royal tongue lashing. He told him how the cow ate the cabbage. Ray, can you read verses 11 to 13, please? Abraham replied, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place. And they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she really is my sister, daughter of my father, through yes. not of my mother. And she became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. Thank you. So why did Abraham call Sarah his sister? It was very convenient. It was very convenient, and she was. Did, Abraham's lie, did Abraham lie about his sister? Did Abraham lie about Sarah being his sister? Yes. It was deceptive. It was a half-truth. Okay. He intended it to be a lie. Yeah. What kind of sister was she? Half-sister. Why did Abraham ask Sarah to say she was his sister in verse 13? So they'll be kind to me? They won't kill me? Because we all know you're, you're good looking. Whose turn is it next? Stacy. Uh, can you read uh, 20, 14 to 16, please? Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it please you. To Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a high, it is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you and before everyone you are in the 
Thank you. What two things did Abimelech give to Abraham in 14? Okay. Livestock and people. Livestock and people. What did he tell Abraham in verse 15? Live anywhere you want. <laughs> yeah. The, the whole land is before you. Take it. What did he tell Sarah he gave to Abraham and why? Thousand shekels of silver. And why? To cover Mine says, it is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all. You have been innocent, Sarah. I'm giving a, a thousand shekels of silver. That's a lot of money. But he didn't give it to her. Nope. No. no. But she said, but he's saying, like, I'm giving this to Abraham for you. For you. Whose turn is it now? Yours, Greg? Verses 17 to 18, please. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his, his slave girl, so that they could have children again. The Lord had closed up every womb in Abimelech's household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Thank you. So what did Abraham do? Pray to God. What did God do after Abraham prayed? Healed his wife. Healed his wife and? Yeah, and opened the wombs of all the women. Did God bless or curse Abimelech? Both. Both. Okay. In the end, he blessed him. In the end, he blessed him. Why did he bless him in the end? Okay. There's a deeper theological meaning for this. Reason. It goes back to chapter 12. We have to remember, why did, why did God bless Abimelech? Kind of repented. The Abrahamic covenant. I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Did Abimelech originally go out to curse Abraham? No. He's innocent. But yet God still blessed him because of how Abimelech treated Abraham even after he dressed down Abraham. And who are the children of Abraham? Believers. So what are we commanded to be? A blessing. And the way we do this is because of the commands that Abraham is to teach his children, which is to perform justice and mercy. Are there people you don't share the gospel with because you are like Abraham and think they don't hear God? <laughs> People from another nation. People from another community. People from another lifestyle. Or people that you think are just too far gone. Which brings us to our conclusion. No, okay, go. Number one, we typically commit the same sins as people we associate with. 
Number two, we still know we are sinning when we commit these sins. Number three, living in fear will get us in trouble. Number four, as we look at God's law, nobody has the legal requirement to enter God's kingdom by their own standard because of their sin. Number five, you must become a new creation in order to be part of God's kingdom. Number six, only Jesus Christ can turn you into a new creation. Number seven, you cannot out-sin God's grace, even to the point of changing your gender. Number eight, God has always protected the messianic line because of his promise of a Savior for you. Number nine. God has the power to prevent you from sinning if you ask him. Number ten. The news of God's salvation for every type of sinner is too great for us to hold to ourselves. We must go and share this good news. And our benediction will be from Psalm 51, verses 1 to 13. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 13. Have mercy on me, O God according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment behold I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me behold you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Ray, can you pray for us, please? Our Father in heaven, we're thankful at this time that we can be to serve your body, body of Christ, where Christ is head of our body. Father, we're thankful for the new covenant that you have with us, that through Jesus, through his shedding of blood and his death on the cross, Calvary, that we have hope of salvation and hope of eternal life. Father, be with us as we read this word and apply it to our lives that we will seek Christ's salvation 
be born again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.